the Dutch Golden Age from the 1580s to the 1670s. College Board Topic 3.5, Absolutism and Constitutionalism explain the factors that contributed to the development of the Dutch Republic. The Dutch Republic, established by a Protestant revolt against the Habsburg monarchy, developed an oligarchy of urban gentry and rural landholders to promote trade and protect traditional rights. Now, if this stuff doesn't mean much to you yet, it will after the, this presentation. And then we talk about 18th century culture and arts. We just had a lesson on the Baroque not, not long ago. Explain how European cultural and intellectual life was maintained and changed throughout the period from 1648 to 1815. There's a little bit of, uh, of a change in continuity here in this particular uh, sentence. The arts moved from the celebration of religious themes and royal power, and we've studied that, we know about that, to an emphasis on private life and the public good. Until about 1750, Baroque art and music promoted religious feeling and was employed by monarchs to illustrate state power. And we've seen that. But there's a change here. 18th century art and literature increasingly reflected the outlook and values of commercial and bourgeois society. And neoclassicism expressed new enlightenment ideals of citizenship, and political participation, which I know sounds very abstract, but we're going to look at some art and you're going to see that. The Netherlands literally means the low country. You can think of the 17th century as the Dutch century. Beginning in the 1580s, the people of the Netherlands acquired a political independence and a religious identity that gave them a sense of confidence and purpose. The Dutch Republic served as a political model it was a republic, it was a federation, and it was constitutional. The Dutch Republic had a radical attitude towards religion, if you want to call Calvinism radical. It had a certain level of religious toleration, especially for the Jews. And perhaps this was because Calvinism had faced many decades of intolerance itself. Perhaps it was because the Dutch understood that intolerance was bad for business. There was also tolerance for anybody with unconventional ideas, such as Baruch Spinoza. The Dutch Republic attained a stable, thriving economy. The golden age of northern Baroque artists and thinkers, anytime you have an expansion of economic prosperity, you're going to have a corresponding expansion of artwork. And that artwork will reflect the values and sensibilities of the time. And this was during the Baroque period, of course. Dutch painters like Rembrandt, uh, Van den Eckhout, Van Riesdiel, Van Avelde, and Vermeer were important northern Baroque artists. And the Dutch Golden Age and the Northern Baroque produced a wider variety of subjects and genres than the Italian Baroque. Monarchs and the Catholic Church were not the main customers in Northern Baroque art, like they were in the Italian Baroque. Here are the types of genres that the Dutch Golden Age of painting could go into. Historical paintings, historic, they were they were on historical events. They could do mythology. That's also considered a historical painting. Biblical paintings were considered historical paintings. Another thing that the, that the golden age of Dutch painting featured was landscapes and cityscapes. Often with some kind of industry going on, windmills or farming or something like that, that appealed to their values. Genre paintings. Scenes from everyday life. Portraits. Portraits of everyday people. Maritime scenes. The Dutch Republic is a strong seafaring nation, so of course they're going to have maritime scenes. The Dutch Republic is also a strong naval power. And still lifes. The Dutch middle class patron wanted paintings that reflected them and modeled their values. Industrious, regular people, working hard at their jobs, people wearing simple, well-made clothing. 
the value of living with generosity, the wealthy and the poor interacting with each other. The church steeple in the background of this painting represents the guiding principle by which the wealthy should respond to the deserving poor. The value of living simply and frugally. In Jan Steen's Beware of Luxury, there's a Calvinistic lesson here. Wealth can bring chaos into a home. Wealth increases our possessions, and more possessions just bring clutter and disorder into our lives. Dutch society. Amsterdam and Rotterdam. These two cities were hallmarks of Dutch Calvinist values. For example, their granaries had enough surplus to feed the population for a year. The Dutch Republic had generally higher salaries than in any other parts of Western Europe. Even women had higher salaries. The Dutch Republic had the Protestant work ethic, thrift and frugality, simplicity versus extravagance. And the Dutch Republic had the highest standard of living in Europe. The View of Dordrecht by Albert Kupp in, 16, in the 1650s. You've got a cityscape here, and you've got ships and windmills. You've got a church. So a lot going on here, a lot of industry, right, and a lot of, of uh, piousness. The Old Church of Amsterdam. This was first built in 1300, which, of course, is, precedes all this. And here's the interior of the old church in Amsterdam. And if, when you first look at this, it looks like it's a, a photograph, but it's actually a painting by Emmanuel de Witt. The Catholic Hidden Church in the Attic in Amsterdam in the 1630s. The interior of a Portuguese synagogue. And this is also Emmanuel de Witt. Portrait of an old Jewish man by Rembrandt. And what you see here reflected is the toleration and the interest in a wider variety of, of religious experience. Beware of Luxury by Jan Steen, which we talked about. It's a genre painting. Still Life with Gilt Goblet by William Heda, 1635. Another genre painting, and this is a still life. Upper class homes in Amsterdam going all the way back to the early 1600s. Patrician houses along the canal in Leiden. The Burger of Delft and His Daughter by Jan Steen. And we talked about what was reflected in this painting. These are all paintings that could show up on an AP exam. The Leiden Baker and His Wife by Jan Steen. Hard workers, simple clothes, proud of what they do. Young woman with a water jug. Nothing terribly fancy, just a lady with a water jug doing what she does. Girl with a Pearl Earring by Jan Vermeer, 1665. And once again, you know, there's not really a title to this painting. We just call it that because she's wearing a pearl earring. Don't know exactly who this person is, but she's wearing kind of plain clothes. The Dutch economy. The Dutch economy. The Dutch exported cut diamonds and linens and pottery. And there was not much inflation in the Dutch Republic. Great Dutch land reclamation project was accelerated during this time. The Dutch built 400 miles of canals to make access to the sea easier for as many towns as possible. And the Dutch were masters of the carrying trade. They had the lowest shipping rates in Europe. 17th century global commerce went all over the world. A Dutch East India ship from the mid-17th century. Dutch art that you should know. Return of the Dutch East India Fleet, 1599. Amsterdam Stock Market, Emmanuel de Witt. Jewish ref refugees helped found this stock market in 1602. Sampling officials of the Draper's Guild, Rembrandt, 1662. 
The Lace Maker. The Night Watch. Another Lace Maker by Jan Vermeer. The Account Keeper. Notice all of these are people working, doing regular jobs. Nothing terribly celebratory about that. A woman holding a balance. A view of death, a cityscape. The astronomer. The geographer. Girl reading a letter with the window open. Just an everyday scene. Nothing special about it. But amazing painting because you can see a reflection in the glass of the window. The music lesson. Africa. Central panel. This must have been the central panel of maybe a triptych. Dutch Delftware. Of course, Delftware is a Dutch city. 18th century Delftware tobacco jars. Fort Orange in the New Netherlands. Dutch intellectual life. The University of Leiden, 1575. By 1645, the University of Leiden was the largest university in the Protestant world. The separation of strong provinces hindered the power of any one church to control the intellectual life in the Dutch Republic. The University of Groningen in 1614, along with Leiden, these were the first international universities. Half the students at these universities were foreigners. René Descartes, French philosopher, lived in Leiden from 1628 to 1649. We'll learn a lot about him during the, our study of the scientific revolution. Dutch optics, the telescope. Most agree that the telescope was invented by Hans Lippershey in 1608. Astronomical pioneer Christian Huygens. He provided an explanation of Saturn's rings, and he also came up with the wave theory of light. Otto van Leeuwenhoek, the microscope, and a discovery of microorganisms. The anatomy lecture of Dr. Nicholas Tulp by Rembrandt, 1632. Here's a detail of that painting. Jan Vermeer and optics. Did Vermeer use some of the new discoveries in optics? Did he use lenses to project the image of the subject onto the canvas? It's argued that Van Loenhek was the model for his painting, The Astronomer. Dutch politics. Spanish Habsburg and Europe in 1556. Philip II of Spain consolidated Habsburg lands at the end of the 16th century. And this is the Spanish Netherlands in 1579. The United Provinces still recognized Spanish rule, but in 1581 they declared their independence. The Dutch Federation. You had regents, and these were at the provincial level. They held virtually all the power, and they were strong advocates of local independence. Then you had the Stadtholder. A Stadtholder was a representative in the States General from each province, and they were responsible for defense and order, and more than one of the seven provinces could have the same Stadtholder. And the States General. This was a confederal assembly, and it conducted foreign affairs, in other words, war, and all issues had to be referred to the local estates. The Stadtholder. The meaning of the Stadtholder and the job function of the Stadtholder changed over time. Before 1581, when the Dutch declared their independence from Habsburg, Spain, the Stadtholder was appointed by the King of Spain to represent royal authority in the Netherlands. That's Royal Spanish Authority. 
Then, in 1581, William the Silent, Prince of Orange, who lived from 1533 to 15, 1584, changed the function of the Stadtholder from representative of the king to rebel leader. So think of him as the first William of Orange, right? because it wasn't until 100 years later that William of Orange, as in William of Mary, would become the king and queen of England. He was a Dutch nobleman and he had been a personal protege of Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. He was even tutored by Charles V's wife. Ailing Charles V even leaned on William for physical support during the 1555 ceremony in which he abdicated from the Spanish throne. The Spanish throne was one of several titles that Charles V held. In 1559, William was appointed Stadtholder by Charles V's son, Philip II, King of Spain. Well, William became a Calvinist, and he had served the Habsburgs for many years, and he turned against his Habsburg masters, which basically amounts to Philip II of Spain. Here's a picture of Philip II pointing his accusatory finger at William and holding his hand. He's very angry. So how did the Dutch Golden Age end? Ended with the Anglo-Dutch Wars. England slowly wrested dominance from the Dutch. The first Anglo-Dutch War was from 1652 to 1654. The second one was from 1665 to 1667. And the third Anglo-Dutch War was 1674 to 1678. King William III... Um, ascended the throne of England in 1689 after the Glorious Revolution. And his wife, Mary, was the daughter of James II. Dutch William. William of Orange accepted an English invitation, as we know, to, to be crowned William III of England in 1689, along with his English wife, Mary, the daughter of the deposed English King James. This was the final revenge of the Dutch against England. 